welcome to Outrage and Optimism. I'm Tom Rivik Karnak. I'm Christiana Figueres. I'm Paul Dickinson. And? And? And I'm Clay Carnell. Uh, Yay! Ah. There you go. Welcome to Outrage and Optimism's US inauguration special. We interrupt the break in our programming between seasons of Outrage and Optimism to bring you this special episode in celebration of the inauguration of President Biden. Plus, we speak to incoming National Climate Policy Chief and beloved friend of this podcast, Gina McCarthy. Thanks for being here. Nicely done, Tom. You can't interrupt. Uh, you can't interrupt a gap. What? Yes, you can. No, you can't. Yes, you so can. We, no, you can't. <laughs> all right, can't. all right. Okay, we're not. So we're not. Bro- we're not broken. Today up. is a good. Is a when you, Today's a good day. After four years of the most divisive and destructive presidency in modern times, we are today seeing the ushering in of a new era. Under Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, the US is moving back toward grown-up, science-driven leadership. It's been quite a journey to get here in just the last few weeks. Since we last talked to you, there was an armed insurrection storming the seat of the world's most powerful democracy. But we appear to be coming through this to a new dawn for the United States and for the world. So friends, as we begin 20 our first episode, the cusp of a new dawn in the world. I've got to ask, is the relief as great as the pain was? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. It's a very good question, Tom. But first, let me just, you know, again, what a, yeah, what a relief. But honestly, my predominant feeling today is a deep sense of gratitude. Yeah. That is my predominant feeling. In, in addition to happiness and jumping up and all of this, a deep sense of gratitude that the light has come back to the White House. Yeah. We have had four years of a blackout in the White House, what I call a dark house, a dark house on all issues, all issues. And the fact that, you know, the lights are back on, the adults are back at the table, responsibility is back there, Uh, social justice, gender, I mean, racial justice, on and on and on, every single issue, health, transparency. I mean, it's just the list of issues just doesn't end. And I am so grateful in order, you know, in addition to being happy about it, I'm just so grateful because to put it in your terms, Tom, the pain of the constant destruction of values, principles, and actions has been so deep, and you know, ending up apparently in um, deep waters. No idea how he's going to get out of what he dug himself into, but um, that's for him to. He's to not our problem out. anymore. But we don't have to worry what, about him. Yeah, it's not our problem anymore. Um, but what a, yes, what a relief and how grateful I am that the United States is is back. Yeah. Mm. It's good to be back. You're ah. back. <laughs> Clay, we'll go, to, we'll go to you in just a sec, Paul, because I want to know your feeling. But Clay, how are you, the only U.S. citizen involved in this podcast? None of us are voting, yet we feel kind of like it's our own homes that's kind of come back from from the brink. But it really is your home. How are you? Yeah, uh, feeling amazing. Uh Ping-ponging between gratitude, relief, just overflowing with optimism, to put it straightforward. I've been thinking how somewhat strange, calm, quiet, and peaceful things have been for the last two weeks, and I attribute some of that to Donald Trump not being on Twitter. But <laughs> No, yeah, I know, no Twitter barrage. It's quiet on Twitter, yeah. It's, yeah. it's just like I've been able to wake up and – spend time thinking about our future. And uh, so today could not have come soon enough. And I'll say this, I've been waiting and all of us here have been waiting for four years for this day and it's finally here. We're very, Mm -hmm. very, very excited. Well, no, congratulations, Clay. As 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 a parent, I know you must be glad. I know how, you know, just a couple of things. I mean, for me personally, like a sense of absolute elation, it's over. Um, what was it that George W. Bush uh, said to Michelle Obama at the inauguration? I'm going to change one word because children listen to this show. That was some weird spit. 
he said. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Bush, uh, uh, Trump's speech ended with, um, you know, we're going to stop this American carnage. And, of course, in the great irony, um, Trump's uh, uh, term ended with the most extraordinary uh, American carnage. But the, the, the corrosion at the soul of democracy has ended. And that is a, a, a cause for, for great celebration around the world. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but, Paul. You see, here is the challenge. I, I live, as you know, on the coast, in front of the ocean, and corrosion is something that I deal with every day. And here's the problem. Once anything starts getting corroded, it's very, very difficult to make that retroactive. And so, you know, in, in addition to the elation that I share and the gratitude and the relief and all of that, I'm actually hugely concerned because this is a very steep hill that the entire Biden administration has to climb. How do you undo this damage? How do you undo the damage to democracy? How do you undo the damage to the um, domestic institutions? How do you undo the fact that so many brilliant minds were fired from the from the government? How, how do you undo the bad relationship that the United States now has with so many other countries? It can be done and they must do that. And that is their responsibility. But it ain't easy. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Christiana, because, I mean, you know, I remember when you and I were dealing with a U.S. government that was trying to face this, right, in the, in the, in the last years of the Obama administration, it was incredibly difficult to actually deal with climate change, even when you had a government that had all of the institutions of democracy on its side, it had understood science, it was moving in that direction. Now we have a Biden administration coming in with a very much weakened governance system as a result of the damage that's been done to it over the last few years and a very ambitious policy agenda. So I think we need to be enthusiastic and excited, but also ready to support that new administration in whatever we can because yes. they're, you know, they're very serious. They know exactly what they're doing, but they have got a long way to go to get us back to where we yeah. need to, to in, yeah. all, in all areas of governing. Yeah, and it's easy, you know, to sort of say, oh, it's it's Donald Trump. It's not Donald Trump. Donald Trump is actually the symptom. The underlying malaise uh, is a lot more complicated in the US uh, and, and many other countries. But in the US, as you've heard me say before, 43 million people below the poverty line. Uh, you've got this weird media where James Murdoch will heavily criticise the right wing, you know, uh, conspiracy theorists, his father happening to own Fox News. You've got uh, Citizens United, and unlimited corporate spending to control the political process. And you've got technology just doing very strange things with media. So uh, though, there's a whole bunch of things we're going to have to address if we, if we want to avoid something like this happening again. And we have to. Mm. So, so one question we should go, we're going to hear from Gina McCarthy shortly, but one thing I'd love to just discuss for a minute is the US is still in a tough spot, right? Because there is still more climate skepticism in the US than in any other country. Now the Biden administration does have control of the House and the Senate. So it actually has the first chance in 12 years to actually push through an agenda that includes climate change. But there's also going to, accompanying that, there has to be a major public engagement process to help people understand that dealing with climate change is a building back better from coronavirus. It is providing the good jobs of the future. What do you think, listeners to this podcast, how can we best help that agenda? What should people keep in mind, US citizens and others, as this begins to unfold? What should we talk about? How should we engage people? What, how should we be using our communications platforms? Because bringing those agendas together, which we've talked about on this podcast before, feels more important than ever at this moment. Mm. Yeah, very well. Uh, well put and well questioned. <laughs> and well questioned, Tom. Um, it, it strikes me that um, there is a huge gap here between um, the weakening of government in all of its forms that has been weakened over the past four, uh, four years, plus the weakening of public trust in government and in each yep. other. Uh, very, very important how we have lost trust in each other in addition to lost trust in government, in corporations, in banks, in everything because of the, um, the continual daily barrage of, of lies. Um, that is 
contrasts, all of that scenario contrasts deeply with what the Biden administration wants and needs to do, which is the only way to make up for four years of lost time, is to take a completely different tack to climate change than uh, than even in the Obama administration. And that is a, a really strategic, integrated approach to all agencies, all departments, um, federal agencies, the entire executive, uh, the the legislative, I mean, everything to bring, orchestrate every single piece, the states, the 50 states. How do you orchestrate all of that potential, which is weakened? How Mm. do you orchestrate that for this? Um, And so in answer to your question, Tom, I think the first thing is to temper our impatience. And that's very difficult because we know (laughs) that they have lost these four years. We know that we're already into the first year of the decisive decade. We have this urgency, right? We wake up with this alarm clock ringing in our belly. But we have to understand that while we're facing this critical urgency, we also have to be patient because they're going to have to do the rebuild at the same time as the pushing through the new policies and the new actions. So they're basically, you know, changing the wheels on a bus that is going, I don't know, 200 miles an hour. And, and that's difficult to do. So I think one thing is to understand the complexity that they're in and then provide them both um, the expectation of moving quickly because we cannot stop that, but also at the same time, the understanding it's the understanding yeah, of the complexity and the, the time that it's going to take to do all of this. So how, you know, I, I come back to the most difficult thing in climate change is to balance impatience with patience. And here we are at the zenith example of how we have to balance our impatience because we know what has to be done with the patience of that comes from understanding the very, very rock, rock bottom situation that they start out from. Hmm. Well, I mean, there's there's um, huge signals going out from this to uh, the business world, you know, major corporations, fossil fuel companies, everyone understands that this new government mean, means a completely new way of doing business. And although, you know, I, I was commenting earlier about the negative impact of, of you know, lobbying to oppose uh, government action, it is also the case that the majority of business wants this problem dealt with. And we will have new regulations that help us deal with the problem of climate change. And I think that there's a real role now, just as we've seen the business community come out against the outrageous insurrection that occurred on the 6th of January. So we need to find a sort of rational middle away from this noise and this kind of aggressive, divisive character. We're going to decarbonize because that's what we have to do. The whole world's behind it. And business, I think, can help set norms and bring people together into a new consensus. But you're absolutely right, Christiana. It's not going to happen overnight. It needs to be done right, and that takes time. Hmm. And I think the parallel thought to to that one, Paul, of businesses doing their thing, um, in addition to the complicated situation that the government has, the third uh, foot on that stool. The first, the third leg is what? What do we do as individuals, especially right. U.S. citizens, but everybody, everybody in every country, and um, and and we, we've been moving toward this for a while, but now we really need to assume our own responsibility and stop this nonsense of exporting responsibility to governments or to national governments or to city governments or to state governments or exporting responsibility to corporations. They all have a responsibility and so do we as individuals. And so in answer to your question, Tom, I would also add we need to assume our responsibility because if, you know, we can't throw rotten eggs at everyone else and say they're not doing their job if we're not doing our job. So assuming our responsibility and going through the daily routines, behaviors that we have with transport, with food, um, with savings, with heating and cooling our houses in those countries that need to. Sorry, we don't. Um, <laughs> all, of these, all, all of these decisions that we make over our own life, on our own daily routine behaviors, patterns, we have to bring those in line also. 
Yeah. It's a great point. And I think that the other place that I would go with that is if you look back historically at these moments of success, you know, for, for, for the movement that we're part of, for the desire to deal with climate change, deal with social issues, it's actually quite a different skill set to win, right? For the last four years, there could be nothing more unifying for everyone that cares about climate and social justice and racism. Everybody has been focused on this one thing, which is Trump has been the problem or a major part of the problem. Now we're going to enter into a world much more filled with opportunity, much more, much more multipolar, but much more likely to diverge into different groups who want slightly different things out of the outcome that could end up competing with each other. So I agree with what you say, Christiana, and I would add to that a willingness to see the bigger picture and keep working together and keep remembering what it is we're all here for because there'll be disappointments as well as successes. And we need to hang together now as coherently as we have for the last four years, even without a common enemy, but with a common goal, which is to pull together and make this a moment of real breakthrough. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how we do that, how you inspire people towards a greater goal, but then empower them to take the individual actions. I'm, I'm really, yeah. I'm really excited to see what this, what this new moment as painful as it is, how it provides the opportunity to do exactly that. Mm. To stick it's together. our first test, uh, Clay, of global solidarity. We've never really had a need for it before, but now's the time we've got to go and learn a whole new skill. Yeah. And feel connected all the way through. You've talked about this, Christiana, the global, the local and the personal, that those levels are all connected. What you do in your own life is fundamentally connected to the global outcome. And we need to feel that integration much more now. Now, shall we turn? And ah, can, Christiana has can a point. Can I do, Lena, say one, <laughs> yeah. more, one more thing, which is um, as though all of the above were easy. The other <laughs> challenge that we all face is how how do we develop a common purpose, a common narrative, um, while still allowing for infinite differentiation in the ways in which we get there? Yeah, and um, and and that's difficult because you know we're we're so used to thinking in mutually exclusive ways and you know if it's either this or it's that um and we have to change that way of thinking to understand that there is a much broader um purpose here that we humans have to pursue and are responsible for and it is a single purpose right we have to act with the sharpness of single purpose but also with the broadness is broadness a word in english Breath. Uh, breath. Thank you. I like to invent words. <laughs> broadness. Broadness is fine. It sounds so breath. sensible. We ought to say Okay. It. With the broadness or the breath of, of everyone, every individual, every corporation, every country, every city, every state, deciding how they are going to move toward that common single purpose. That's difficult to understand that that is possible. But it's key. It is absolutely key to success. And, um, and, and that is a mental shift, right? That's a mental paradigm shift that is absolutely necessary, um, that goes hand in hand with the radical collaboration that, um, that we have to exercise now if we are to get to our short-term targets in time. Yeah. It, you're absolutely right, Christiane. It's just us, we, me, having that alignment, 100%. Sorry, Tom. No, it's fine. Um, so let us turn to our conversation, our very exciting conversation with Gina McCarthy. And then when we come back, because the conversation we've had so far has been about the domestic situation in the US and the conversation with Gina, as your listener is about to hear, is also really about what's going to happen in the US and what the strategy is. And then afterwards, Christiane, let's talk a little bit about the international picture and how that's different. Um, but for those who don't know, and I'm sure there are very few uh, who listen to this podcast, Gina McCarthy is about to enter President Biden's White House later this week to lead the brand new White House Office of Climate Policy. Her role is going to require her to coordinate across all cabinet roles and all government agencies. Her experience makes her uniquely qualified for this, I'm sure, incredibly challenging position. She's been a leading advocate for smart, successful strategies to protect public health for more than 30 years. She most recently was the chief executive officer of NRDC, but before that, she was the administrator of the US EPA under President Obama. 
Um, she's very much been at the leading edge of a paradigm shift in how you talk about climate, which expressly links climate action with global public health. She led on establishing the Obama-era Clean Power Plan, which set the first national standards for reducing carbon emissions. She is a brilliant person. She is just as eloquent and forthright and powerful and um, engaged and brilliant as you would expect. Here's the conversation we had just yesterday with Gina McCarthy. And I should say that Gina was generous enough to stop her car uh, because she was driving from Boston that you will immediately hear when she starts speaking, uh, from Boston, which is home to her, down to Washington, D.C. Uh, how wonderful that everyone, before they enter the new White House, has to have a COVID vaccine. And she stopped the car uh, at, uh, I don't know, one of these stops and was willing to chat to us uh, sitting in front of her wheel. She was driving her car herself. Yeah. Um, and as in typical Gina McCarthy fashion, and was uh, generous with her time. I'm just off to Washington, D.C. to run the country, but I'm going to pull in to speak to Outrage and Optimism. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and I'm going to add something since I'm on the podcast today. This is one of the most exciting conversations we have ever had on the podcast, so buckle up. It's a good one. Here we go. Freight train coming through. Gina McCarthy, what an exciting, exciting, exciting <laughs> job you have just landed. We are beside ourselves with excitement. Uh, thank you so much for taking time while you're driving down to D.C. Uh, to get And your thank vaccine. you for taking the job. Oh, it's, it's yes. are you kidding me? I, I've been thanking everybody for asking me. This is so awesome. I'm so excited. It is so exciting. So, so Gina, a new White House Office of Climate Policy. So um, fascinating. Here's what we assume, that you've been put in the control tower over all climate policy domestic, uh, and that you will ensure that there is coherence, consistency, ambition, speed, et cetera, et cetera, um, across yep. all agencies, across all departments, across Capitol Hill, House and Senate. Yes. Um, so both looking at what the executive doing as well as what is possible in the legislative. Is is that a lay person's um, description of your new job? Yes, that is my professional description of my new job, and I'm so glad you didn't. I'm so glad you didn't say Zara Zarina. I really hate that. Queen is okay, but not not the yes. rest. Supreme ruler. Yes. <laughs> well, um, that is incredibly um, exciting, and of course, as as we look at it from the outside, because none of us are U.S. citizens, but as we look at it from the outside, we we see that there is both a Big opportunity, that's the optimism piece, but also a narrow window, frankly, to ensure the first step that I'm assuming is on your agenda, which is to ensure that climate goals cut across all government agencies, et cetera, et cetera, um, and into recovery stimulus plans. Now, we've heard the first speech of um, President-elect Biden and he's very clear that, as he should be, that his first priority is going to be the recovery stimulus. He did weave in climate in there. But for those of us who are a little bit concerned about not his willingness or his commitment, but the political viability, the political yeah. viability of ensuring that this, that all of this recovery stimulus is both socially inclusive and climate responsible. What is, yep. what is your sense? Well, Christiana, you're not wrong about the fact that it's not just about the speed, but it's the scale of the scale of actions that need to be taken now. Mm. And so I think one of the, the reasons that, that uh, President-elect Biden created this office was to understand that the scale of the federal government is large. If we bring the, the, the capacity of the federal government to the table, then we can not only move new climate solutions out, but deploy them faster and more broadly than we might otherwise. Because it's just not good enough to do small things right now. It's good right. enough to do a thousand small things hmm. at pace and scope. 
And so there's, there's, I think, right now an awesome opportunity. But you're absolutely right. The president-elect knows that the very first thing we have to do is to address the COVID crisis. I mean, we have not had leadership in the United States, and we have tremendous amounts of people dying who could and should be getting the vaccine now. And so his first job was to make sure that we had a plan of attack for that. Absolutely. And looking at what do we do about the economic reco recovery, the, the part where climate comes in is that we're trying to build a future that we want to have now, mm -hmm. not just recover to the future that used to be. And so we are not going to go backwards. We are going to reverse what Trump has done, but it is going to take rebuilding. But that doesn't yep. mean the pace needs to be slow or that the scope needs to be minimized. We have to do both of those things. So what we're trying to do uh, as these issues are rolled out, and as you'll see President Biden um, taking steps forward, we're trying to explain to people that we don't just have first day things to announce that won't necessarily rely on the ability of Congress to act quickly. But we do have executive authority and we will move out on day one to send the signals that we need. But beyond that, we'll have a full week of rollouts because climate isn't about a single announcement. It's about a big change. And yes. so we are not going to, so I don't want people to think that the first and only thing that's happening is to ask Congress for big support on COVID and, and to let the other stuff wait. There is no way that's happening. So you're going to see uh, day one really roll into a week one. And after that, you're going to see announcements all the time about what we see, what we're doing, what we can do, not just with, with federal policies and programs that might take time, but with procurement from day one. The federal government buys a ton of stuff. Whether you like it or you don't, they do. And so if we can use the leverage of that procurement to send market signals, we can start making the scope of change that happened that we really need. But it goes well beyond procurement. You know, we, we, uh, I'm so excited because President-elect Biden has chosen people for the cabinet that are really fabulous. Yes, yeah, I mean, they yes, are outside yes. the box. I'm not going to need to go around and push people. I'm going to have to run around and fast to catch up with them. You know, Jennifer Granholm is like a whirlwind on her own. <laughs> and she's the Department of Energy. You know, right. I, I, she knows the value of research moving forward, but she also knows that the Department of Energy can deploy. It can help us move mountains. And so that's the excitement of this job. You know, we I'm not going to be just at EPA anymore. I'm going to be talking to every cabinet and they're going to have plans in their pockets in day one and that we're going to start rolling out from day one, two, three, moving it out to show the world, Christiana, that uh, we ain't in Trump land anymore. <laughs> we're, we're, we're in the real right. world and we're going to do our jobs in the real world to protect people and our kids' future. Gene. Well, what a what an uh, what a relief, uh, Gina, and and you do have a fantastic climate team, right? You have Deb Holland, you have, as you say, yes. Jennifer Granholm, you have Michael Reagan, you have Brenda Mallory, and of course, you have uh, Secretary of State uh, John Kerry. So not a <laughs> bad team there at all. But but how much of all of this is going to require Republican support, and how? How do you begin to bridge that divide? Because honestly, we can't continue this absolutely unbearable gap. Well, Christiana, you know, uh, you know, and I think we all have to admit that there is a big divide in our country right now. I mean, that was clearly evident uh, last week, and it remains evident in terms of how Congress is is discussing its duties and responsibilities and making decisions, even after. Uh, the tremendous riot that we saw um, and insurrection, really, that we saw last week. So we know there's challenges ahead. And, and I think one of the reasons why, you know, many of us have hope is that, you know, 
President-elect Biden is a unifier. Hmm. You know, just think about what he yeah. did to get a strong climate plan, which his plan is remarkably strong. And it got strong and stronger because he created a unity task force. Lots of them, nine of them, as a matter of fact, one of which that I participated in, which was actually co-chaired by uh, John Kerry uh, that we all know. Secretary Kerry is an amazing person um, and, and did a great job. But AOC was the other co-chair. I mean, she is a force to be reckoned with. So we Indeed. brought sort of all of our our policy nerdy people like me, which really I'm not, but a policy nerdy group. And we brought together also environmental justice constituents like Catherine Flowers, who is now a dear friend of mine, who has been struggling with water and wastewater issues in Alabama and down in the deep south, where we know the populations who have been left behind. And we brought progressives together and we developed a strong plan. And it's my responsibility to keep that unity together, because that's how we're going to win. We're going to listen to the voice of young people. We're going to listen to people who don't think like you or me, but think their own way and can help us deal with systemic racism that has been holding us back. Hmm. You know, Biden's whole plan and his whole charge to this office is not just to think about climate. It's to think about climate and how it moves in concert with the goals of providing good jobs, the goal of building an economic future we can all be proud of, and the goal of making sure that those who benefit are the communities that have been marginalized and overburdened by traditional pollution and are in the crosshairs of climate. And damn it, if this country can't think intersectionally and multidimensionally, then we have gone further back than I think. Hmm. So I think we just got to keep all those issues in mind because there is that future for us. Mm. And, and I'm hoping that with young people's voices and with voters voting and with the election results we saw in Georgia, that we are going to be able to drive a congressional agenda. But even if not, we are going to drive an executive action agenda that's going to jumpstart us in this right direction. Gina, this is so exciting. I cannot tell you. I mean, everyone around the world is cheering in response to this. And my God, we've been waiting for this. I just want to ask you about, and you hinted at this just now, about it not just being about climate, about fusing the issues together and helping people to understand that a recovery from COVID, economic in inclusivity and other issues are all connected to climate now. That's going to be presumably a major part of what you're focused on, because I'm guessing that along with a congressional push, there's also going to be a mass communications campaign to help the American people understand the intersections yeah. of these different issues and the fact that climate getting on top of this is an essential part of all areas of their lives getting better. So what's your plan for that? How are you going to bring the American people with you? There is actually a strong constituency for taking climate action now that we didn't have before. Hmm. Um, and, and, and it's palpable in the U.S. And I think a lot of that is the fact that we know that you can't ignore science like this past administration has done. You have to. And people know that their life is fragile and hmm. they want people to act on their behalf. But moving forward, we, one of the reasons to connect it so closely to jobs and so closely to health benefits the, of, for communities that have been left behind is we've got to make the climate challenge real and relevant to every human being. So we're not going to just make big policy decisions. We're going to talk about the number of jobs that that's going to grow. We're going to make sure that labor isn't left behind, but is actually part of the strategy moving us forward. We are going to talk about the health benefits and who benefits. And we're, instead of just being big about policy, we're going to roll out stories. You know, we got to tell the story. We got to explain why your family would be better off tomorrow, not just the planet in it in the future. And so I think we can lick this if we bring climate down to size hmm. and we take real steps that people can in their own community see what it means for them. You know, I, I'm not suggesting people are that narrow that they don't care about one another. I'm suggesting that government needs to be the voice of working for the people and show them that we know enough about what that we're doing 
that we can actually make an appreciable difference in their health and well-being and the way they think about the future and how hopeful they can be and how they can be part of the middle class, not just continuing to be living in the kind of poverty that we're seeing grow in the United States. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just tired of negativity. I'm tired of big talk. I'm tired of big policies. You know, it's time to really relate to the people we're supposed to serve and let all of us see a future that has them in it. Okay, Gina, but one more question from me. And, you know, it's so exciting for the whole world. The leadership of the US and your administration is going to inspire us all again. But I'm worried about the future. It wasn't just Donald Trump. It was a whole bunch of lobbyists, industry, money. And we know you've got Citizens United. We know corporations can spend without limit. But we, I have to ask you, can you use your position with the control of both houses of Congress to get some kind of regulation through that stops lobbying, undermining our laws? Well, let me tell you, a couple of things are going on that, that may, may excite you. And one is that we have a National Economic Council that's run by Brian Deese, who was really one of uh, my colleagues in the White House that helped us get things done during the Obama administration. And we have Janet Yellen, who is now the Secretary of the Treasury. Now, between those two, they are working together to think about how do we bring visibility and transparency into the finance sector so that people can see where their money is going. We have labor. If we, if we get labor involved to the extent that we want, all of a sudden, maybe those pension funds that were out of our reach before can now be better targeted. So I don't suggest that we can change all of the dynamics that are causing trouble from a climate perspective or an economic development perspective or political. But I can tell you that we can change our direction and we can show people that government is looking at their best interest and they are looking at the finance world because it's about time for the finance world to start spending money in a way that's better for all of us, not just better for the pockets of the rich. And if we can figure that out, even with just transparency, political constituencies, small P and big, will follow. Gina, we want to let you go because we know that you are anxious to get back on the road and down to D.C. So could I just ask you one last question? We're very excited for all the plans that you have and all of the deep preparation that you and your team have made. What are the concerns? Where do you see the weaknesses, the challenges, the barriers? Where, where are those? You know, um, obviously there are many. I, I'm not uh, uh, naive to the idea that the fossil fuel companies are going to continue to be very challenging. I guess for us, the issue is that it looks like the coal sector, even with, the, with all the help that President Trump gave them, they're no longer a factor. We have to. Re so really, the question is, how do we work with the labor community to transition people into different jobs that still have access to unions and still have opportunities for a living wage? That's going to be one of the biggest challenges. And we have to look at some infrastructure like transmission lines. You know, we're going to have to be telling people that we don't need to get to 100 percent renewable from our from the perspective of today, we needed to be 200% renewable because everything has to start getting electrified. Right. And so it's going to be a big challenge for us to not just deploy what we have now, but start making those fundamental infrastructure investments. And it's all about who we can bring with us. And so I do think that while, while coal is waning, we need to help with those communities. But the next venture is obviously going to be to take a close look at natural gas, get those the methane leaks taken care of, but also look at how we make sure that as a bridge fuel, it can be bridged out at the right time when we have an ability to have people on board and working uh, fully engaged and invested in the kind of renewable and clean energy future we actually need. Mm. Well, it's just, it's so great to have a U.S. government 
person speaks such perfect, inspiring <laughs> sense. I know our listeners across the world will wish you and your administration nothing but the best. Well, we're going to work our damnedest. And that was for you, Christiana. I wanted you Thank to know you. that I'm not, I'm not turning into a pinheaded bureaucrat. <laughs> Yay! Yay. Maybe, I, maybe I just always was. I, I, don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. Far from it. So, Gina, I think we know the response to this, but we always uh, close out our uh, conversations with our delightful guests by asking, uh, where are you in, 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 in the space between optimistic and outraged? Um, we we think there is that we need both. We need to be optimistic, but we also need to be outraged. But we always ask our guests to sort of pinpoint where are they in that spectrum. So as you as you drive down to DC, where do you pin, pinpoint yourself on that spectrum? Well, I have ping ponged from a thirty five percent in the negative to seventy five <laughs> to eighty percent in the positive. Hmm. That's where I am, and Middle ground. which means which means I'm dizzy and my head spinning, uh, but I am enormously hopeful about the future. Fantastic, superb, superb. Gina McCarthy, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for taking the job. Thank you for your vision. Thank you for not turning into a boring diplomat that speaks in <laughs> polite uh, diplomatic language. Please keep it up. Uh, we love you. We admire you. We respect you. Thank you, Gina. I love you, too. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. So how wonderful, how amazing, what a privilege to speak to Gina McCarthy as she is driving down to D.C. to take up this incredibly important job. What do you guys leave that discussion with? How are you feeling? Standing ovation. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Can you feel the energy coming off her? Her absolute sort of passion. She was She's like, ready for it. Of, yeah. She'd been sitting there for four years thinking, I know what I'd do. And now she is and will. What did you think, Tom? Yeah, what do you think, Tom? Well, I mean, you know, lots of things. I mean, the, the main thing I think is I cannot imagine anyone with more energy and dynamism mm. and determination to hold that position. And I remember when she was the administrator of the EPA, how she, in some of the times she appeared in front of committees in the House and the Senate, how she used her kind of charm and her accent and her just way of being to kind of get in and engage with people who wouldn't maybe necessarily have agreed with her on some issues. She talked about public health and... As, as we were talking to her, I kind of remembered how she used that breadth of experience, those different ways of engaging to bring people who wouldn't necessarily have agreed, have agreed with her along with her. And I was just reflecting as we were talking about what a perfect fit she is, because as this sort of, you know, science driven, brilliant, charismatic woman who, of course, has an agenda that is based on science, but is not, as far as I can tell, kind of ideologically driven in any particular way beyond wanting to get the right outcome for the planet and for the future. What a perfect person to sit right in the middle of this administration and coordinate. I mean, you cannot imagine a more fascinating and more difficult job than doing the thing that we've tried to do for decades and actually get the US on board with this thing. And I think, I mean, if she gets it through, I think it's sort of, you know, she should get the Nobel Peace Prize for it. I don't know, because it just it just feels like the most critical job in the world right now that she is holding. Yeah, I was, you know, I think in little pictures, as you all know, and as we were talking um, to her, what came up for me visually is this absolutely brilliant octopus. Uh, hmm. with this unbelievable mind and with I don't know how many tentacles out there into every single area of possibility to ensure that this all gets orchestrated. And again, to go back to our, you know, conversation before the Gina um, interview, single purpose, but every tentacle res responding to a different need and a different pace and a different way of doing things because you don't do things the same in the Department of Energy than you do in, in trade yeah. or in, at the um, at, at state, right? Each of this has to be differentiated, but it's all brought together by the octopus at the center. Um, and, uh, and, and that is, uh, that's Gina's role. It's never, no one has ever had a, a role like that, a position and an authority, um, like that in the United States, or in fact, I can't even think of any other country that is doing it like that. And frankly, that's the way all of us should be doing it. 
So, uh, Christian, I totally agree. And I mean, I, I think uh, um, that this episode should be called The Octopus in the Centre is Gina McCarthy. But whether or not <laughs> that gets through the committees that exist, we'll find out. Um, but I also just want to ask you, you know, this is obviously going to have a massive impact in the US. I mean, it's going to be so exciting and so consequential to watch what happens now in the next 100 days as this team of brilliant focused strategists sort of arrive in DC and get to work. And obviously they have all our support and help such as we can provide it. But what is this going to mean for the rest of the world? Because obviously we've got COP26 at the end of the year. This is massive wind in the sails of those who hope that we will be able to deliver a transformative outcome at COP26. But also the damage that was done in the last four years is very real, right? How quickly can this team and John Kerry, of course, who has the, the equivalent role to Gina's, but the international version of it. How quickly right, right, can, right. can he now sort of get everything back on track? I mean, he knows all the players. Are they going to believe him when he shows up and says, we're now back to normal? Or are they going to be kind of like, forget it, you know, in four years, you could be out and some version of Trump could be back in? Well, I think it's going to depend on how quickly they can start delivering on their domestic homework mm. um, and uh, the the integrity and the credibility of their international reach out is going to very much depend on domestic um, achievements very quickly. But, but let's not forget that Biden uh, is himself an internationalist, right? Yes. Uh, yes, he's the president of the United States, but he was also for a long time on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He chaired it for a while. He really, he he himself really understands that climate is a multilateral issue and a multinational issue, and that it has to be answered that way without shying away from the U.S. responsibility and certainly without sacrificing U.S. interests. Um, but then when he gets coupled with uh, John Kerry, who was former Secretary of State and who, as we know, was personally responsible for the U.S. negotiation of the Paris Agreement at 2 and 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning, um, then um, it's quite a, quite a team. And so I think that they're actually going to be able to bring together in a very complementary way the domestic challenges and achievements with the international reach out and, um, and, and credibility of their um, track record. You know, it's it is just an amazing time. Uh, but Tom, you you said that some version of Trump getting back in, and I I tried to ask Gina about that, but I mean that like she's completely busy being the octopus that's running this complete reinvention of uh, uh, you know the way we produce and consume energy in in the world's largest democracy. I think that with um, a a climate friendly government controlling the, the the presidency in both houses of Congress. We have to, as a society, as, 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 as business people, as NGOs, um, everyone has to think about how we can try and put this critical national security agenda beyond political flip-flop. We cannot allow another whole bunch of lobbyists to come in and put the lives of this generation, our children, and their children at risk. It just can't happen again. So we've got to try and put in you know we got we got to say look you know you can have chlorine in the chicken or whatever you need to do but we just are not going to allow abrupt climate change to happen ever again and we're going to put those laws somewhere where lobbyists can't get at them yeah i mean if history is any guide of that right the moments where you have a president and a congress all of whom are clearly lined up to do something about climate change a strategic team that want to do it it's happened in the past right it happened when obama came in in 08 but the likelihood is that it won't happen again for quite a long time. So we've got those two years now. And if we don't get it done, the consequences are very serious. <laughs> so, so, so again, no so pressure, it's like, Gina we're, McCarthy we're really up against it when All we're right. losing and we're really up against it when we're ahead. So we're really up against it. I would just like to say a special thank you, please, to all the comics, frankly, to Stephen Colbert, who every single night just threw me a lifeline, <laughs> to, Sarah, to Sarah Cooper, to all those people who, who who help carry, you know, hundreds of millions of us around the world through Trump. And I mean, the list goes on forever. Your, 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 um, Trevor Noah. Yeah, sorry, Trevor Noah, Jimmy John Kimmel. Oliver, yeah. Samantha B. Just thank you. Thank you from all of us for all you did. Mm. I am actually tearing up because mm. I really mean it. All right. This has been fun and it's been very fun to have you with us this week, Clay. Congratulations Thanks. to you as well on your country yeah. being back. 
It's very Yay! exciting. Yep. This is theoretically a break for Outrage and Optimism. I realise it hasn't been much of a break and we've been putting content out a lot, but um, we're going to get better at having a break. Um, but we are just now on the cusp of the beginning of season three. So there won't be a, an episode as regular this week, but we've had this bonus. And so we will be back next week with the beginning of season three. So thanks for listening today. What a day. This is historic. This is a big yes. step forward. Whatever comes next, the next fight, we should enjoy date moments like this. We'll see you all in a week's time. Bye. 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 Okay. Happy Inauguration Day. Season three starts next week, and we have been making many calls and have had many meetings uh, regarding what is to come next. And, you know, the one thing we talk about the most is what people are telling us from our listener survey. And... Our listener survey is still happening. We want to still hear from you. So link is in the show notes. It takes a few minutes to fill out and helps us make this podcast better for you. So, you know, turn on the inauguration coverage, pop a bottle of champagne or, you know, something equally as expensive and enjoy filling out the survey. Thank you. Link is below. Now, if this is your first time listening, I'm Clay, producer of the podcast, and thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed the episode, you can hit subscribe and brand new episodes will appear as if like magic every single week. And while it's not magic, it's actually a lot of work. You know who works to make this happen? Sarah Law, Katie Bradford, Lara Richardson, Sophie McDonald, Freya Newman, Sarah Thomas, and Sharon Johnson, the Global Optimism Team. Marina Mancilia Herman is executive producer, Clay Carnell is producer, and this podcast is a Global Optimism production. Cristiana Figueres, Tom Rivet Karnak, and the Paul Dickinson do the hosting. They're the hosts. And thank you to our guest this week, the one and only Gina McCarthy. Okay, quickly before we go, I just want to talk about what is about to happen. So, we're about to watch some history today, you know, on the same steps that two weeks prior to today were stormed by an armed insurrection made up of the citizens of its own country to suppress the voice of the people in a free and fair election. We are going to witness something amazing. The first woman, first black person and first person of Asian descent will be elected to our country's second highest office. Vice president. It's amazing. Have you said it out loud yet? Madam vice president. Has a nice... Has a nice ring to it. Madam Vice President. Madam Vice President. Okay, last two things. At Global Optimism on social media, you can find us and follow us. And last but not least, next week we have on Johan Rockstrom in our first episode of season three. So fill out that survey, hit subscribe, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>